Good evening, and welcome to the Marine Biological Laboratory and the MBL Falmouth Forum. My name is Susan Morse, and I'm the chair of the Falmouth Forum Committee. Thank you all for joining us in person tonight in the Cornelia Clapp Auditorium, and also for those of you who are joining us virtually. Before we begin tonight's presentation, I'd like to thank the Friends of the MBL for bringing free cultural enrichment to our community through their sponsorship of the Falmouth Forum series. This series is supported by an endowment established by a generous group of individuals, foundations, and organizations. The programming that we are able to bring to this community is directly related to the amount of donations contributed to the Falmouth Forum Endowment. I'm pleased to say that we have a generous matching gift of $25,000 from an anonymous donor, and we have surpassed the midway point of our $100,000 endowment goal. However, there is work to do, and I hope those of you here tonight and those of you watching virtually will consider supporting the forum and help us reach our goal. There are several ways to give. Probably the best is to go to mbl.edu slash give. Or for those of you in the auditorium tonight, visit the table at the back where there are some other options for ways to give. And of course, if you have already made a donation, we thank you so much. For those of you in the auditorium, I'd just like to remind you to please silence your cell phones. Tonight, we are privileged to have Dr. John Holdren with us to introduce our speaker. Many of you know Dr. Holdren from past Falmouth forums at which he spoke. At present, Dr. Holdren is research professor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and the co-director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program in the school's Belfry Center for Science and International Affairs. From January 2009 to January 2017, Dr. Holdren was President Obama's science advisor and the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Prior to his service in the Obama administration, Dr. Holdren was president of the Woodwell Climate Research Center. He continues his association with Woodwell as senior advisor to its president. Dr. Holdren was a member of the Board of Trustees of the MacArthur Foundation from 1991 to 2005, where he was a colleague of our speaker, Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot, who was also on the board. And so it seems appropriate for someone who knows her professionally and personally to have the honor of introducing her tonight. Dr. Holdren. Well, thank you very much, Susan, for that kind introduction to the introducer. Um, I will speak a little bit longer about uh, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, but not too much longer because uh, her remarks, I'm sure, will be much more entertaining than my introduction. Uh, as uh, Susan already gave away, I have known Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot now for uh, 31 years, uh, since we were appointed at the same time to the board of the MacArthur Foundation, served together there uh, for 14 years until 2005, and then Sarah got two more years because she was too valuable as the chairman of the board uh, to be turned over with the rest of us uh, in that uh, class of, of 1991, uh, coming onto the board. But at the time I met Sarah in 1991, she was already immensely distinguished. She had completed her PhD in the sociology of education in 1972, 
uh, in the School of Education at Harvard University. She was immediately appointed to the faculty, uh, and she rose rapidly through the ranks of the faculty to a full professorship and then an endowed professorship, as mentioned in the uh, invitation to this event. Um, and uh, among many, many other honors, she became uh, the first African-American woman to have an endowed professorship at Stanford named in her honor. She already had an endowed professorship at Swarthmore named in her honor, but uh, this was uh, a very major first at Harvard. Uh, on the MacArthur board, uh, where we got to know each other quite well, uh, we were sometimes called the MacArthur twins because both of us had received MacArthur Foundation Prize Fellowships in the early 1980s, and we were the first people in that category uh, to be appointed to the board. Um, and we found we had a lot in common, uh, although we were also complements in the sense that Sarah knew a huge amount about things that I knew nothing about, and I know a little bit about a few things that she didn't know very much about, and so we were uh, quite effective on the board. But the thing I want to tell you uh, about Sarah and the MacArthur Foundation Board is something I've actually said in, in meetings before, which is the MacArthur Board at the time uh, was populated with some very senior individuals with some very big egos. Uh, they included Jonah Salk, uh, the inventor of a polio vaccine. They included Jerome Wiesner, who had been president of MIT and the science advisor to John F. Kennedy. Uh, they included Murray Gelman, who got a Nobel Prize in physics at the age of 38 uh, and was um, a major figure in, uh, in physics uh, throughout his long career, but also uh, a very energetic dabbler in a great many other fields, including languages. He was fond of correcting people on the pronunciation of their own last name. Uh, and uh, sure... Shirley Hufstetler, who had been the Secretary of Education and a very distinguished judge uh, in California. Uh, and the interesting thing about the MacArthur Board is uh, with all those big egos on it, it was often very contentious. Uh, people were always interrupting each other. Uh, Jerry Wiesner and Murray Gelman were particularly conspicuous in that respect. Neither one could get half a sentence out without being interrupted by the other, saying, you're all wrong. We need to go in an entirely different direction as a board than what you're proposing. But the interesting thing, one of the many interesting things about Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot's uh, performance on the board, if you will, was that nobody ever interrupted her. When Sarah spoke, everybody listened. And that was because Sarah never said anything unless she had something to say. And when she had something to say, it was always insightful, it was always wise, it was always deep. Uh, and I, I'm serious. I don't remember in 14 years on the board with Sarah ever seeing anybody of all those big egos interrupt Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. Uh, in the meantime, she has acquired uh, 30 honorary degrees. She has written 11 books, every one of them remarkable. Uh, some of the ideas from one of them are uh, on the agenda tonight, I think. She's going to be talking about some of, those, uh, some of those ideas with us here tonight. And I'm particularly glad, personally, that in the advertisement it said that she was going to talk about living a full and fulfilling life, not only from 50 to 75, but after 75. And that last is particularly important to me and my wife. So. Uh, so, Sarah, it's all yours. Thank you so much for being here. As I anticipated coming this evening, the thing that I wanted to do most was listen to John Holdren talk about me. <laughs> um, it's always been a pleasure to listen to him talk about me, and it's been a great, great adventure and pleasure being his dear friend and colleague. So um, I'm delighted to be here. I feel a little bit rusty. This is my first time uh, speaking in person in three years. I've been speaking and giving speeches over Zoom, but this is the first time I get to see you, and yet I don't really see you. And so I'm, I'm going to have to um, get going. Uh, the title of my talk this evening is The Third Chapter, Looking Back and Giving Forward. Sylvia, 
A friend of a friend who turned 68 last year has for almost 30 years had a lucrative real estate practice in Brookline, a relatively affluent near suburb of Boston. She has loved the wheeling and dealing, the relationship building that carries the trust and hopes of her clients. The expertise she has gathered over the years on contracts, real estate law, architecture, and design. And she has enjoyed her well-earned professional reputation as a crackerjack businesswoman who can outmuscle and outnegotiate anyone in her field with a deft combination of grit and grace. In 2008, as the market plunged and the foreclosures sprouted, even in the well-heeled neighborhoods of Brookline, Sylvia saw her business decline, falter, and finally dry up to almost nothing. She admits that even before the economic disaster, she was growing tired of the routines of her work. She had reached a point where she felt burnout and bored. Her business had lost its challenge and vitality. As a matter of fact, as she looks back on it, she had lived with a chronic restlessness for quite a while, but the looming loss of work forced her hand. Her decision to join the Peace Corps came as an epiphany, a sudden awakening that allowed her to realize that life did not have to shut down, it could open up. She whispers to me, her voice laced with eagerness and anxiety, that she has never been so excited as she packs up her large, stately Victorian home where she raised her four children, puts her stuff in storage, and heads off to work on development projects in Nepal. And there is Robert, the 72-year-old retired mechanical engineer who I met at an ice cream joint on the side of the road in rural New Hampshire. He and his wife of 50 years are out on their ritual Sunday drive, and they're looking to pick up an interesting conversation with a stranger. They sit down next to me at the picnic table and begin in a place where we all meet with family stories. I listen to their proud tales about their grandchildren scattered all over the country and admire the photographs of their smiling faces. But soon, with a bit of gentle prodding from his wife, Abby, the conversation turns to Robert's new passion, and he goes to the car to fetch his drawings postcard-sized pen and ink sketches of birds. He's always loved birds, listening to their songs in the morning light, watching them visit the bird feeders outside his kitchen window, observing the social interactions among them. And he has always said, I wish I had an artistic bone in my body so I could draw the beauty I see in them. A week after his retirement party, as he faced the surprising emptiness in front of him, he took the leap of faith and signed up for three drawing courses, what he called my total immersion, at the Adult Education Center. This has become my life, he says in confessional tones, as I remark on the steady improvement I see in his portfolio of work, and as, I, as he talks about the exhilaration and vulnerability of learning something new. It was because of scores of ordinary everyday encounters like these with people who were risking the unknown, embarking on new learning and re-envisioning their lives with people whose voices held a mixture of passion, anxiety, and secrecy that I followed my curiosity and embarked on a three-year research project of inquiry, witness, and storytelling interviewing and observing 40 women and men across the country, a journey that culminated in my book, the third chapter, Passion, Risk, and Adventure in the 25 Years After 50. My book focuses on the creative and purposeful learning that goes on between 50 and 75, the chapter that follows young adulthood and middle age. It asks, what are our sources of inspiration? What are our greatest fears and inhibitions? What are our major barriers to learning? And what allows us to pursue new adventures? How are the processes of learning, adaptation, experimentation, and mastery different during this period of life? Do maturity and life experiences support a greater sense of liberation and collaboration, a new level of patience, perspective, and confidence and a sturdy sense of self that
that permits risk-taking? How do we hang on to our dignity, our sense of authority and self-respect when the awkwardness and imbalance of new learning makes us feel infantilized? How do we balance and negotiate the tensions between the losses and gains of new commitments? What are some of the things that we in our third chapters discover that we can't learn? And finally, what are the connections that can be drawn between individual learning, cultural creativity, and commun community building? What institutional innovations, shifts in cultural priorities, and educational reforms might support the translations from individual gain to public good? My hope is that some of the insights and lessons embedded in these narratives will resonate with your work and your careers, your life transitions, and your yearnings, that you will hear in my observations useful perspectives on teaching and learning, on professional and personal development, on leadership and service, and that my analysis will shine light on the connections between creative and courageous adult development and healthy organizational cultures, underscoring the imperative that to be good citizens and stewards, we must be lifelong learners, curious, adventurous, and generous pathfinders in a rapidly changing society and world. In the midst of these strange and anxious times in which we are living, it is difficult to refocus our lenses inward and outward on the developmental and cultural themes we are engaging and witnessing. In some ways, the crisis we are navigating, the dangerous pandemic, the urgent cries for justice and racial reckoning, the economic decline and suffering, the violent assaults on our democracy, the horrific casualties of war in the Ukraine are overwhelmingly preoccupying for all of us. But they also offer us, I believe, the opportunity to reconsider and examine anew the patterns, rituals, habits, and priorities of our lives. I'm hoping that this evening's exploration of learning and adventure in our third chapters, or John Beyond, will be such an opportunity that it will challenge some of our unquestioned assumptions and practices and open our hearts and minds perhaps to alternative perspectives. A look at the recent census figures begins to tell the story of our emerging voices, visibility and vitality, of the promise and prominence of those of us in our third chapters. 10,000 baby boomers turn 60 every day, and we are healthier, better educated, and yearning for a productive and enjoyable alternative to retirement. The arc of life and learning is continually being expanded and redefined. Not only are people living longer, but demographers tell us that the third chapter represents a new definitive developmental period in our culture, one that comes along only once a century. Last century, for example, we discovered, discovered and labeled adolescence as a distinct developmental period between childhood and adulthood. We began to see it as a time of enormous change, drama, and fluctuation, as an explanation of new alignments in the strained relationships between parents and their teenagers, as the initial treacherous step towards independence and self-definition. Adolescence became a cultural construct that was stamped into our psyches and written into the social scripts of our families, our schools, and our communities. This century is ours. We are forging a new and distinctive chapter in life, those of us between 50 and 75, and those of us who are neither young nor old, are beginning to redefine our views about the casualties and opportunities of aging. We are challenging cultural definitions of strength, maturity, power, and sexiness. This is a chapter in life when the traditional norms, rules, and rituals of our career seem less encompassing and restrictive, when we are embracing new challenges and searching for greater meaning in life. The boomer generation, once defined by our, by our youthful bravado, boldness, achievements, opportunism, 
bring to the third chapter our resources, our social capital, and our sense of authority, our appetite for new learning and lives of service, our yearning for inspiration and adventure. It turns out that reinvention in the third chapter is filled with poignant paradoxes. We experience the twin sensations of loss and liberation, constancy and change, urgency and patience, hard work and exuberant play. The process of learning something new feels both familiar and strange, exciting and terrifying, mature and childlike, both in character and out of body, like returning home and setting out on an adventure to an unknown destination. This is true whether we're talking about learning a new skill, craft, or art form, like learning to speak a foreign language, playing the jazz piano, or becoming a playwright, or whether we are learning to feel or express a broader and deeper emotional repertoire, freeing us from the bondage of the rigid requirements of decorum forged in our childhood, or whether we are learning to grieve after the death of a loved one, learning to make ourselves vulnerable and not retreat from intimacy, or whether we are talking about shifting the focus of our energies and priorities from solitary, individualistic, and competitive to community-based and collaborative, from making it up the ladder of success to making an imprint on the lives of others. One of the central paradoxes that I explore in my book, the one that I think resonates most deeply with this moment in our country's history and with our individual and collective quests, I call looking back and giving forward. Giving forward, making a difference, leaving a legacy, holding each of us accountable to something larger than ourselves. These impulses of generosity and service are particularly poignant and powerful for those of us in our third chapters. The impulses in us also echo the framework forged by developmental psychologist Eric Erickson almost 75 years ago, when he articulated eight developmental stages across the life cycle, each one defined by a tension between constancy and change, progression and regression. The penultimate stage the one that resonates most closely with those of us in our third chapters, Erickson calls generativity versus stagnation. Generativity, a kind of giving forward, is the productive and creative work of our third chapters. It underscores our impulse to nurture and guide the next generations, an engagement that includes teaching, mentoring, writing, and innovation artistic expression, activism, and advocacy. The alternative is not pretty. It is stagnation. It turns out that we in our third chapters are able to tolerate the ambivalence, the imbalance, sorry, risk-taking and vulnerabilities of choosing change over constancy, of leaving the old and entering the new. When we can begin to picture and then compose and narrate our new life. Ironically, the pictures that we construct are often shaped and shaded by a return to our childhoods, to the values and rituals into which we were socialized in our families of origin, to the historical and cultural moments in which we were embedded. We look to our origins, to the lessons we learned at home about service, charity, and justice, about our collective responsibility and citizenship, and feel, often for the first time, compelled to find a way to enact those values and principles. Or some of us do just the opposite. We look toward home and decide that we do not want to carry on our parents' legacy. We do not want to be burdened or constrained by their values, ideologies, and teachings. Our third chapters, in fact, resist the call of home. However we heed the call, 
through embrace or dissent or some ambivalent middle ground. By this stage in our lives, we are likely to have accumulated a rich array of experiences, wisdom, and skills that we are yearning to use wisely and well. Over the years, we've honed our expertise, identified our gifts, and learned how we learn. What seems to surge up in us like a compelling imperative is the wish to give forward, to be useful, to make an imprint. In the third chapter, we want to turn the tables, rewrite our priorities, reinvest in our relationships, recalibrate the meaning of success, even re-envision the concept of work. I use the term giving forward rather than the more typical notion of giving back as a way of reflecting how we in our third chapters must develop ways of engagement and service that point toward the future and not get stuck in the anachronisms and nostalgia of the past. In order to be useful, we must respond to the contemporary context and envision a future into which our altruism might make a contribution. We need to listen to the voices and views of our children and our children's children. An intergenerational discourse that offers clues about how we might serve and be useful Looking back honors the wisdom and weight of our ancestry. Giving forward is futuristic and transformational, enriching and enlarging those who give and those who receive. Philosopher Frederick Buchner catch, captures the mutual gain and the real meaning of the word charity, a benevolence and generosity that gives forward and circles back. He says, your vocation is that place where your deep gladness meets the world's great hunger. Your vocation is that place where your deep gladness meets the world's great hunger. So here are two stories, both local and modest, and beautiful and earth-shaking, both about the taking of small, courageous steps deeper and deeper into the world. The first about teaching astronomy, the second about discovering our voices. Both narratives resonate with a powerful dialectic of looking backwards into the future. And these are stories, so you can just relax and listen. The story, the first story is about teaching astronomy. Roma Wolf, a 57-year-old physicist who has spent all of her professional career in the laboratory, enjoying the quiet and order of the space, the exacting familiar rituals of the scientific process, and the pursuit of the objective quantitative evidence, recently began to feel, after 30 years, the limits and constraints of her existence. The solitude and discipline of her work that used to feel safe and generative started to feel claustrophobic. The rituals began to seem routine. The questions that used to inspire curiosity began to strike her as dull and formulaic. But mostly this, she sensed the need to, as she put it, make a difference on our planet in a more direct and a more immediate way. She yearned to teach, to serve, to give forward. Cutting back on her hours in the lab, Roma signed up for a mentoring program where she teaches middle school black, brown, and poor students in an after-school program. The subject which always fascinated her the most when she was a young adolescent, astronomy. In her first year of teaching, Roma admits that this is the hardest, most challenging work that she has ever done. Learning the science now long forgotten and finding a palatable and relevant way to present it learning to relate to and discipline the children and capture their imaginations, learning to recover from the awkwardness and public failures that come with being a total novice. I am so completely uncool, she says with a smile. But harder still is venturing forth into places, as she says, formally forbidden, places she used to consider ominous and dangerous. Even though she had lived in Chicago, 
for 30, the past 30 years, first as a graduate student, then as a research professor at the University of Chicago. Roma had never traveled far from the shadows of the university. She had never even dared to drive down the mean streets of the west side with her car doors locked. Never ever had a real conversation with an adolescent. She is single and without children of her own. Never experienced being the token white person in a crowd of black folks. Never felt so far outside of her element. These were all new experiences that felt both exhilarating and terrifying to her. The most difficult part of venturing forth, she claims, was losing her fear, being willing to face the unknown, and ridding herself of the deeply ingrained prejudices which had contained her life and restricted her movements. Now, after almost a year of working with the kids, after months of awkwardness and many missteps. She has begun to feel a little, more, a little bit more comfortable, a little less foreign, and a lot less afraid. Now when Roma teaches them astronomy, the subject that she loved the most when she was their age, she looks into their faces and occasionally she recognizes herself. She can begin to see in them the curiosity and the eagerness that she once felt. The kid in me has been sparked, she exclaims, looking amazed at the familiar sight she sees in this still strange place that has begun to feel like home. The second story is about discovering our voices. Sometimes the journey home requires that people confront the ancient traumas of their childhood. People in their third chapters find that they do not want to live any longer with the hurts, the remorse, the guilt connected to their childhoods. Going home, metaphorically, psychologically, literally, spiritually, to face the old impediments becomes a way of moving forward with their lives. And it requires courage, resolve, patience, and new learning. Occasionally, my interviewees discovered the source and site of their early injuries in the course of our conversations together. All of a sudden, in the retelling of a story they had told many times before, they would stumble upon a detail, a metaphor, a sign, or a symbol that would unlock feelings that would open up a floodgate of tears or they would begin to replay an experience from their childhood, say a conversation with a parent or a teacher, that they had always seen as positive and uplifting and discover the dark underbelly, a reinterpretation of a practice story that would suddenly bring forth the pain from the long ago injury. Stephen Fox had this kind of surprising and unsettling revelation when I interviewed him. At 67, Stephen Fox is a public health doctor who has spent his professional life doing epidemiological research in the lab and working in the rural regions of West Africa to eradicate malaria. Before going to medical school, he was a Peace Corps volunteer in Sierra Leone, an experience which etched in him a lifelong commitment to international relief work. From, from an upper-middle-class African-American family, he has lived his life simply and with great humility, working behind the scenes to fight disease and oppression all over the world, joining his professional engagement and expertise with his personal and moral commitments. He believes, he says, in thinking and acting, locally and globally. In a decision that snuck up on him, Stephen decided to sign up for voice lessons at the local community music school. This was a radical departure from his workaholic life, which has never left him the time or space to pursue pleasurable avocations, never left him any time to play. As he began to recount to me the story from his childhood that motivated his new passion for singing, the big adventure of his third chapter, he discovered the subtle hurt carried in, his, carried in his mother's glance one Sunday afternoon when he was about six. 
Stephen's favorite memory of early childhood is sitting on his mother's lap, listening to the radio when the Metropolitan Opera broadcasted their weekly performances. He had an immediate love affair with opera and begged his mother to take voice lessons. She did not refuse him permission, but there was something in her eyes, a subtle dismissiveness that made Stephen withdraw his request. Somehow she made me feel like opera singing was something for sissies, he recalls sadly. Then when Stephen became a young adult, he himself decided that opera was too frivolous and aristocratic for someone who was devoting his life to changing the world. But a few years ago, he decided that he had denied himself long enough, and he secretly began taking voice lessons. This was the hardest, most exciting work I've ever done, simply thrilling, he says about his first year of study, in which he never produced a note that even vaguely resembled the luscious tones that he had heard across the airwaves 60 years before. I can vouch for that because I listened to him sing. <laughs> the sound does not matter to Stephen, however. What matters is the chance he now has to live his dream that is what he calls my big turn on, and the high that comes with a freedom he has never known when he sings. What began as a benign and gentle story about being wrapped in his mother's arms, listening to opera, in the retelling during our interview, turns into a painful encounter with her disapproval of him. His tears catch up with him as he traces the connections between his recognition of the injury and his opportunity in the third chapter to heal the hurt with his voice. And one final surprise, an epiphany really, that Stephen discovers in the retelling of this ancient tale. He begins to recognize that learning to sing, learning to breathe from his diaphragm, learning to use his body as a sound channel has somehow migrated into his work in public health. He believes that he is a better, stronger, more authoritative, more empathic doctor now that he has liberated his voice. His giving forward in West Africa is becoming his beautiful and heartfelt aria. If that's not one of the most beautiful stories you've heard, then you haven't lived. <laughs> it almost brings tears to my eyes every time I do this. These two stories of Roma and Stephen begin to weave the tapestry of collective wisdom that I gathered from the 40 women and men whose new learning and giving forward I was privileged to witness. This evening, because I cannot ever resist being the teacher, I want to conclude my talk with five large meta lessons, each one big and challenging, each one layered with a min many, 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 many lessons. The first lesson on education, the second lesson on intergenerational relationships, the third lesson on scarcity and reinvention, the fourth lesson on crossing boundaries, and the fifth and final lesson on Im imagery and innovation. A brief caveat, even though we are living, as I've said before tonight, in strange and anxious times, even though our sense of well-being, hopefulness, and sanity are under assault, and even though we all feel vulnerable to the prolonged, seemingly endless crises invading our everyday lives, I do believe that these five meta lessons remain timely, valid, and right on. It might be that during these difficult days, some of the drama is amplified. It might be that the developmental and cultural themes and the emotional undercurrents feel more intense and heartbreaking. But the fundamental shape and core dynamics of these lessons, I hope, will ring true with you, will feel authentic to you. The first lesson is on schooling and learning. 
New learning and giving forward in the third chapter will require us to rethink the purposes, structures, and boundaries of schooling in our society. As I listened to the narratives of my interviewees, I was struck by the contrast and contradictions that they drew between their formal education from elementary school through college and graduate training and the motivations and challenges of their learning and service as older adults, the very attitudes and aptitudes that made them stand out and excel in school, competition, speed, caution, singular ambition, and public praise, seem to be barriers to the risk-taking, collaboration, patience, adventurousness, and private pleasure that allowed them to embark on new learning 30 or 40 years later. They had to, as one person said, unlearn old school habits. Others talked about having to shed the negative and pejorative labels bestowed upon them wittingly or unwittingly by teachers who saw them as lazy or stupid or unmotivated, by teachers who saw them as, as problems, labels and prophecies which had left deep scars in them. New learning in their third chapters required that they confront the ancient wounds, recover their dignity, and rise to the challenge of rediscovering their gifts. That's really true, how deep some of those traumas were. As an educator who has spent a half century of my life studying the culture and character of schools and the trajectories of human development and learning, I have for a long time worried about the disjunctures and contradictions that so often exist between in-school and out-of-school learning, between the curricula and norms of classrooms and what we need to know and believe about ourselves in order to cope and thrive in the world. But my research for this book punctuated for me the myopia and short-sightedness of educational policies and practices in a narrowing environment of standards and standardization, accountability, and regulation that do not anticipate the long trajectory of learning across the life cycle. I now believe that the designers of childhood education need to consider the developmental tasks of adulthood and old age, as well as those of childhood, when they design institutional structures, construct curricula, and develop effective pedagogies. Using an architectural metaphor, Sociologist and lifespan theorist Orville Brim warns, and I quote, to study childhood without its lifelong aftermath is to pour a foundation and neglect the edifice. Second lesson on intergenerational relationships. Not only do we need to redesign our schools to honor the central dynamic of continuity and change across the life cycle. We also need to reduce the generational segregation and the perception of generational competition and territoriality between the young and the old that permeates our society. The movement across school community boundaries needs to flow in two directions. Children preparing to live as citizens in an increasingly complex, diverse global reality need to be offered opportunities for apprenticeship and service in the real world. And people in their third chapters need to be seen as valued mentors who bring with them not only the accumulated knowledge of our work and careers, but also our wisdom, experience, and sense of perspective. The crossing of boundaries for both generations need to express a respectful reciprocity, a dynamic pedagogy in which young and old are both teachers and learners. In order for a culture to flourish, younger people need the stories of older adults living among them. Likewise, composing of our third chapter narratives helps each of us identify and express our own creativity, generosity, and service. 
This was certainly the case as I listened to third chapter learners who discovered while they told me their stories, new insights into their own motivations and capacities and a new sense of control and agency over their actions. Their stories became their anchor, their stories became their compass. Are you with me? Okay. The third lesson is on scarcity and reinvention. This lesson I learned after my book was published. After my book was published. The third chapter was launched in January of 2009, a terrible, frightening time economically, a time of individual and societal fear and angst, a time of treachery and suffering, loss and chaos, in many ways not unlike the times we are experiencing now. As I toured the country spreading my message of reinvention and personal renewal, I steeled myself for tearful tales of lament and discouragement. I expected to hear the stories, the voices of despair. Instead, on radio talk shows, through emails and blogs, in bookstores, libraries, and auditoriums, folks from all walks of life, across the borders of race, class, gender, geography, and immigrant status, consistently offered their tales of struggle, resilience, and adaptation, their stories of steadfastness, determination, and creativity. A 57-year-old laid-off factory worker in Detroit described over NPR to me one day, using his welding skills to build huge sculptures of dinosaurs, strange, funky creatures mimicking the hulking images from his favorite movie, Jurassic Park. When he first started, he could not have called them art. He would not have called them art. He sold them for barter or next to nothing at flea markets. Then as he mastered his craft and gained self-confidence, he began to be recognized by art dealers who for handsome sums exhibited them at fancy galleries in the city. A 70-year-old gynecologist obstetrician in Texas felt burnt out from the tedium of his practice and what he called his, quote, involuntary participation in a deteriorating and unjust healthcare system. So he had returned to his childhood love of Broadway theater, plunged back into training, and was now performing the classic songs on cruise liners. <laughs> Not only that, when he's ashore, he's, he volunteers as an obstetrician in the Central Valley of California, delivering the babies of migrant farmers. Over the last several years, I have heard these same tonal calibrations of darkness and light, crisis and optimism in the larger public policy discourses, in conversations about dwindling school budgets and the need to do more with less, echoes of the spontaneous voices of the third chapter folks from diverse backgrounds who have talked to me across the country. The lesson, reinvention and giving forward in the third chapter requires a delicate and precarious balance between truth-telling and inspiration, loss and liberation, and sacrifice and generosity. And these years when we are neither young nor old seem to be particularly ripe for seeking discovering, and nurturing this balance. This is the penultimate lesson, the fourth lesson, the next to the last. Thank you for holding with me. On crossing boundaries, those people who are courageous and generous enough to risk crossing boundaries into the unknown in their efforts to give forward, whether they are navigating the borders of race, class, gender, generation, or geography, seem to follow similar steps on their journey. The first step is curiosity. Women and men who navigate the boundaries of learning begin with a deep curiosity. They are interested in knowing something new, understanding the way something works, asking the probing questions, 
and seeking a new way of being in the world. The second step requires that they let go of their fear, the fear of the unknown and the fear of failure. Conquering the fear is not done by some rational listing of the pros and cons or by some calculation of the benefits and liabilities, but by deciding to take the audacious, bodacious leap of faith. Once we take the leap of faith, we face the possibility of failure and the probability, at least in the short run, of making fools of ourselves. Humor saves us. Losing the fear opens the way for the step three of the border crossers' new learning, the willingness to be vulnerable, open, and exposed, to fail publicly, to experiment without embarrassment and humiliation. In fact, failure becomes one of our most important diagnostic tools for learning and the best way to learn how we learn. Developing empathy is the fourth step that boundary crossers must master in learning something new and giving forward. We must be able to put ourselves in the place of those who are our teachers, those we are seeking to understand who have a different perspective or a strange way of doing things. The final step, and one that we can see most clearly in our rear view mirrors, is the recognition that new learning does not mean losing touch with life on the other side of the border. As a matter of fact, the work of the third chapter is integrative. We find ways of constructing something out of the disparate elements of our long lives expanding our repertoires, and merging the old and the new into something whole and layered and deep. Said novelist Toni Morrison, who before her death a few years ago spoke from the outer edges of her third chapter, she said, the borders are our natural sites of creation, the places where we invent, transgress, and create. The borders are our natural sites of creation, the places where we invent, transgress, and create. And the fifth and final lesson is on imagery and innovation. We're coming home. Giving forward should not only be seen as an individual pursuit, a solitary gesture of goodwill, an act of heroism by one brave soul. Fundamental social change will require collective action, including challenging the negative and infantilizing cultural imagery that continues to distort the lives and identities of older adults. It will require changes in the public discourse and policies that offer us greater visibility and voice. And it will require major institutional innovations that allow for more access and opportunity including rethinking the boundaries and culture of schools, the trajectories and context of formal and informal learning, the arc and exits of our professional careers, and the essential meaning of work. Currently, we are missing the necessary infrastructures that might effectively harness the action and energy of those of us in our third chapters. Organizational redesign of the various arenas of learning will have to allow for shifts in our routine and our rhythms across our lifetimes, offering us multiple opportunities to recalibrate the balance between work and love, between work, family, and community, and between work and play, all of which may help us revise and expand our definitions of a meaningful and purposeful life. Citing a confluence of changes in life expectancy, in developmental patterns, and in societal expectations, cultural historians Harry Moody and Thomas Cole call the third chapter a season in search of a purpose. A season in search of a purpose. What a perfect sentiment for this moment in our history and for this season of our lives. 
we in our third chapters can become pioneers of purpose, helping to lead the way to a new and compelling vision of later life, a vision that inspires and provokes all of us to find large and small ways, dramatic and subtle ways, extraordinary and ordinary ways to give forward. So inspired by the luminous narratives of our pioneers of purpose in my book, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, throughout our country, and across the world, let us go forth. Let us look to the stars. Let us lift up our voices. Let us go forth, and with deep gladness, meets the world great hunger. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love the whistle. That's uh, <laughs> what I love to hear when I go speak at high school. The guys in the back, the tall basketball players. you an opportunity to ask Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot some questions. And I see a hand raised uh, already. And I'm going to, John Collins is on this side of the aisle. And we ask that you talk directly into the microphone so that our folks that are watching virtually at home can hear the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Here at MBL, people would come from many ways. And after they showed and told and gave us what they needed and we gave back, we would go to eat. And we have four jokes. This one is an Anglitarian joke, and it is for you. Very short. Why did the scarecrow get her job? Why did the scarecrow get her job? Get her job? That's right. I don't know. She, she, mind you, was outstanding in her field. Uh, thank you. <laughs> We have, we have a question down here. Yes, I'd like to ask if you have given serious thought to writing about the fourth chapter? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I have refused to do with each of my books, which is unusual, I think John would tell you too, for a scholar, is to do anything that seems to follow the last book, or seems to be in some ways treading the same ground. Because in some ways, I consider each of these projects as opportunities to take these kind of risks and new adventures. And luckily, in my kind of work, I'm able to do that. Um, but that's a good question. And always, when I go out to talk about the third chapter, someone asks it. And someone, uh, because most people are not in their third chapters anymore, <laughs> or a lot are not, and they're anticipating the next chapter. And I think one of the things that I really truly feel is that most of what I have said about the third chapter, as long as you can remain relatively healthy and in relationship to other people and in community, right, you, might, you are able to figure out a way of um, moving in the same sort of directions that I'm talking about here with the third chapter. Um, even as I said, the third chapter, when you are neither young nor old, and every time I say that now, every year I say that now, I'm feeling a little less young and a little older, <laughs> right? And, um, and I was saying to my son the other day, um, who's usually a wonderful, supportive, good guy to me. I was saying because I was struggling with arthritis, 
um, which is the reason I'm not standing up and talking to you today. He said, if you use your cane, I said, I just don't want to look like an old woman. He said, Mom, you are an old woman. <laughs> You're a beautiful old woman, but you are an old woman. So I think, you know, um, so I'd say that, first of all. But I'd also say that, as with all developmental sequences, they're very individual, and they're, the, the markers are very arbitrary. So I can imagine someone feeling very much like a third chapter person, as I've described it, and being 85 or 87 or something, and other people who are in their early 60s feeling as if they're in the fourth chapter. And in other words, these are, these are not um, markers that are so defined um, in, in real life for all of us. Um, uh, today I begin the beyond. It's my birthday. Oh, oh and I've turned happy 75. Birthday. Thank you. Yes, happy birthday. Um, a question I have for you is often um, I describe myself or other people talk as they're aging about slowing down. And um, I'm wondering if it's a case of we're not slowing down, it's just that the world has sped up. So have you made that observation or do you feel like we in the beyond are slowing down? You know, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I think, that obviously, um, there are ways in which, and I, I felt this definitely during the pandemic, you know, when life was so isolated and I felt so alone and I, I was desperate to be with more people. And I, I have felt this kind of slowing down in my mind. I have. Um, and even preparing this talk, um, felt slower for me than usual, you know, because I haven't been in intercourse with the world in the way I typically am. But I also think that, that, that there's something about this time that, that, is, that feels urgent, you know, that fe you feel as if I want to do it, I want to get to it, and now, and why wait, and why be cautious, and why be careful? Get out there and do it. And there's a part of us, too, that is more I think, more adventurous, more risk-taking, because we are not so cautious and concerned about how other people might see us or how we even might see ourselves. We're ready to get out there. So I think there is also this urgency. And I also think, as I think about the insights that I might have, for example, in a moment, that those come more quickly. Those are based on experience. You know, those are based on perspective taking. Um, those are based on being willing to tell myself the truth about what I'm thinking and feeling. And so in that way, that's speedier. So I think it's both is happening. But you're right, the world is spinning very quickly. And um, sometimes it's very hard to keep up with that. One of the things that I talked about earlier was the, the, how we must be in conversation intergenerationally. We just must be. I mean, and, and in general, our society is so age-segregated. Age um, and so I, I find myself throwing myself into conversations with younger people on purpose um, and listening very hard to what they have to say. And, um, and I think that's helpful, too. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the tensions in our society seems to be between the right to be the individual that you can be, and that has had a huge emphasis in our educational structure, uh, versus the responsibility to be part of community. But do you see, when you mentioned the need to look at educating young, younger people at the same time that you look ahead to what they're going to be doing in their lives. Was that one of the themes that you were thinking about, or does that make sense? The first, let me make sure I'm understanding what you're asking. Are you asking that there is a tension between individual pursuit and self-satisfaction and being a part of a larger community and collective? Um, I, I think some people see it that way. Uh, I think, and I think that in some ways it's a very American view of the world and of society, 
that there's some kind of tension between self-satisfaction, um, self-direction, and um, even self-esteem, and being part of something larger than yourself. My view, and I think one a way in which I was raised, is that my identity is very tied up in the community, um, and very tied up with an idea of, and more and more as I get older and older, and older um, of figuring out what I can offer now to the development and sustenance and nourishment of that larger community. And, I, and all the more, um, not, not only community writ large, but in relation, relationships of, of intimacy, family relationships, I think um, I, I, want to, I want to give to more and get more from. Uh, friend, great, great friendships, I feel this way about. So I think we are defined very much by other people, <laughs> our relationships to other people, and the roles, the many roles that we choose to play in the community at large. Thank you. You're welcome. I've made two leaps into two new professions in this new life before 75. And I think I'm hoping this book of yours that is coming out is helping people get through that fear of making that leap. Because I think that is what holds a lot of people back. And I had a, I have, maybe she's here, a gifted art teacher that just got me through that leap of fear mm -hmm. of, of jumping in and going and pushing and going further. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping you offer that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that it's not just fear. It's, this, it's sort of imbalance, you know, and chaos sometimes in doing that. But you're absolutely right. And that, and that sometimes people can mentor us through it. Um, Sometimes those people who are close to us are a little fearful of the change that's going on with us. You know, the original contract I made with you is that you'd be like that. And now you're saying you want to do that. And one of the people I talked to in this book was a, you know, a very kind of successful, rich money man, financial guy, right? and working all the time and all the time. And he hit the third chapter and said, enough, and uh, was ready to go home. And so he, he, he said this to me. He said, you know, there I am. I'm rowing into shore. I can't wait to get home. I can't wait to be with my wife and get home. And as I come to the shore, I see she's in the canoe, and she's paddling out to sea. <laughs> she can't wait to get out into the world, right? Uh, so there is this sometimes that the fear is also of losing the steady companionship and the contract that has been you know, decided upon in this partnership or family or whatever it is that keeps us going. Thank you so much, Sarah, for a, just a wonderful time tonight. We so appreciate it. Um, Eight Cousins is here with, out in the lobby with some of Sarah's books. So um, you can read on and learn a little bit more about what we need to do and what is available to us in this uh, wonderful third chapter. Uh, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. And um, have a good evening. Thank you.